Philip Dre, welcome to the show. Ah, thanks for having me. So uh, you wrote a, just come out of the book called The Fair Chase, The Epic Story of Hunting in America. And I think I told you in the email, this is definitely an epic story because it covers hunting, the sort of the history of the outdoors and camping, the conservation movement. You've got, you've managed to fit in the, the native, the Indian wars in there. I'm curious, what got you and to writing the history of hunting, was this something you did as a young man? You wanted to explore it further? You know, it's funny because it's actually sort of the opposite. I grew up in Minneapolis and I was sort of like the Jewish Tom Sawyer or something in a way. I, I always loved that about Minnesota, the kind of the great outdoors, the fact they called it the land of sky blue waters. There was a lot of hunting and fishing and nature was, it was very much a theme, sort of, uh, you know, outdoor sports. I did little of it myself, mostly just fishing in the city lakes, of which there are many. But I always remembered when I grew up, I always kind of remembered I had a fondness for that whole atmosphere. And so I always kind of wanted to write about it. And I think partly it was that as a historian, I had written several books of history and I looked at hunting as something that had never really been written about that much as a part of American history with a long trajectory, partly because it's been a divisive issue for many years, like about a century, really. And I think it deserved to have kind of a, a sort of a holistic approach. Someone look at it in a sort of ecumenical way, like not judging it necessarily, but just looking at it, reporting what was there. So just to, you know, for our listeners, this is a, a history of the not hunting for subsistence, but hunting for sport. Well, that does sort of come into it, of course, a little bit, because those two overlap quite a bit. But yes, you're right. It's about sport hunting, how, how yes, as, as, like, as sport as a pastime became popular. Right. And, and well, that's interesting. So, you know, we, we all, you know, there's that, uh, you talk about in the book, the, the hunting hypothesis, like hunt, there's this argument that hunting is what made us humans. And of course, tribes around the world, you know, cavemen, that's how we, that's how they got their food is they hunted. When did hunting transition from this something you did to feed yourself to a thing that you did just for the thrill and excitement of the activity itself? You know, that's one of those, it's a very good question and one that we'll probably never really know the answer to. The only thing we can surmise is from looking at old, you know, prehistoric cave drawings of, as we know, the hunt was something, or at least you know, large animals were things that fascinated early man. And we don't know exactly when that transition took place, but my guess is that the aspect of sport was probably entered into it, entered into it at very early on. We know that definitely in antiquity, I think it's Plato, you know, writes about the difference between the sportsman and the subsistence hunter, you know, and sort of giving larger cred to the sport hunter, someone who brings a kind of gentlemanly attitude toward the hunt and respects the animals they're hunting, this sort of thing. So that exists even in the pre-Christian era. So basically the answer is it, it probably goes back a very long way. So hunting in America, we have to understand that we have to understand hunting in Europe. So how did, what was European sport hunting like before, like since the middle ages and then, you know, from there, like, how did that influence American sport hunting customs and norms? You're right that it really was, it, it was during the uh, Middle Ages that hunting became sort of codified, if you will, as a gentlemanly pursuit. Throughout Europe, the French were very much into hunting. And I think the first book about hunting was published in French and il a largely illustrated book. During, after the um, Norman invasion, of course, it came to England as well, this idea of the gentlemanly hunt. And that's where, of course, we're all familiar with the sort of British approach, the history of hunting in Britain. You know, the royal deer, Robin Hood and his merry men, falconry, eventually the development of fox hunting. And of course, Britain has a very, very rich history of sport, uh, the sport of hunting. And even a, a extensive nomenclature, as you know, of it's almost sort of comical of different names for parts of the hunt. The, you know, Queen Elizabeth was an, was an ardent hunter, as was her father, Henry VIII, and, and so on. So it was a really like a kind of an obsession. The only trouble in England, of course, was that there was always a, a debate about the use of the land. And of course, that's where you always hear about the king's deer and 
you know, forbidden food that was forbidden to the common people who were not supposed to be killing deer and this kind of thing. And that's one reason why, of course, you find so many British hunters want, were very eager to come to America because America was a place with no, it was the complete opposite. Instead of these landed gentry with their portioned off lands that you were not supposed to trot on, we had the wide open spaces here and Buffalo and all, you know, in other words, the vast range of the Great Plains, for instance, or even the Adirondacks, those were very, very appealing to British hunters. I mean, what were some of the norms of this sort of gentleman hunter? Like, and this is kind of, this kind of goes into the idea of fair chase, right? Like, did they have rules where you just couldn't just go slaughter a fox, right? You, there, you, there was a certain code you had to follow for the, in order for the hunt to be honorable. Right, exactly. They called it, in Britain, they used to call it true sportsmanship. Uh, in America, it became known as fair chase. It basically was, uh, over the years, of course, it changes depending on what the, what the sort of uh, infringements on it are. And those change with technology a little bit. But basically, just as you would imagine, it was an ethos that suggested that the hunt was a more admirable sport if due respect was paid to the prey animals. In other words, that they were given a chance to flee. They weren't unfairly. Now, of course, people are that people often scoff at that because obviously a hunter with a high powered rifle is always going to have a huge advantage over an animal, prey animal. But the idea being that, for instance, you did not like game birds, you could only shoot them in the air or you would not necessarily bait animals with food or whatever it might be or you would not imitate the sound of a of a of a of a infant animal or a bleeding animal to lure an adult and so on and so on there were just a certain code and again it changed over time nowadays it might refer to not using trail cameras or drones or something like that in the 19th century for instance in the adirondacks it was a huge dispute for many years about whether you could chase deer into bodies of water where they, of course, were easily killed because they don't swim very fast. And this was a very common way to bag a deer for a visiting tourist hunter. The guides would chase the deer into the lake. The boat would catch up with the deer that was struggling to get away. And, of course, it could be easily killed. And that was very much came to be very much disputed as an ungentlemanly or unsportsmanlike form of hunting. It was just a kind of way to distinguish the sport of hunting from other more crude pastimes. So hunting in Europe was something that the gentry did, the aristocracy. Did that carry over here in the United States or did it eventually democratize where it was something that just every average Joe Blow could hunt for sport? Didn't matter if you're a part of the landed gentry. Yeah, no, it did, of course, here much more quickly. It, it became something that was accessible to all. It can, for one thing, the land was available to, to, to all, basically. I mean, it, it was... It's only been really in the last generation or two, in fact, that a lot of private property owners forbid hunters coming on their land. It used to be that even if property was property owned, private, privately owned rather, it was fine for hunters to, to come there. But no, to answer your question, it was much quicker. Of course, there always, was, there always were elite hunters here because they were the ones who could afford the equipment, the guns, and to maybe travel someplace remote far away. You know, New York was a big epicenter of hunting interest. And, you know, for a gentleman hunter from New York or Westchester to take himself out to the Adirondacks or even out to Minnesota, Wisconsin, you know, it was, it, it was expensive. But to answer your question, yes, of course, you suddenly had people right on the living very close to hunting grounds and they saw huntable animals all around them. And so, yes, of course, it was a much more democratized process. And again, that's why a lot of British and European hunters of means lost no time coming over here because they thought, why should we poke around here looking for a deer we can hunt in England when out here in America, there's all kinds of, you know, elk, bison, coyote, uh, you know, it was, it was a wonderful opportunity for them and, and they didn't hesitate to seize it. So you mentioned in the, you know, our introduction that hunting has had, there's been controversy, sport hunting, you know, for a long time. Did, what did you, did we see this sort of the founding of the Republic or maybe even in the 19th century? Did, what did the pu American public think of sport hunters? Were, did they admire them? Were they, they sort of ambivalent towards them? What was the status of the hunter then? Well, it's actually kind of interesting because, of course, 
in colonial times, hunters were not often looked upon very favorably. They were considered either sport or subsistence hunters, really, because in the old sort of conservative days, say in New England, the idea that was the much of the focus was on creating civilized spaces. And so those people who chose to live far out in the woods hunting were looked on a little bit askance. In other words, they weren't they weren't church going people. They were living, you know, as somebody said at the time, like they're sort of half animals themselves. They're living out there uh, traipsing around in the woods and and what have you. That changed over time. One thing that was helped reform their image quite a bit was the American Revolution, in which you suddenly had the buckskin frontiersman emerge as a hero. You know, the sharpshooting American who, with his with his musket, coming out of the woods to help to defeat the British. And so ever after that, then you sort of had the sort of the kind of Daniel Boone type image, Davy Crockett, the, the backwoodsman in his buckskin. You know, yes, he might be skulking around the woods, but He's basically, he's on our side. He's a good guy. And of course, what they did, they used to call them the long hunters, people like Boone. What they were doing was help to settle areas like Kentucky and Missouri, places like that. So they were beneficial to society. So yeah, I mean, eventually the image changed and you began to have hunting overall seen as much more as something, a much more acceptable pursuit. One thing I should mention, of course, it's interesting is that A lot of other sport at the time was looked down upon, especially that involving animals. For instance, like ratting was something which most people today would never even know of. But, you know, it had to do with competitions to see how quickly or how many rats could be killed by dogs in a pit. These were popular urban pastimes. Other, you know, cockfighting those kind of sports came to be looked down upon. And by comparison, something like hunting, which involved going out into nature, challenging oneself by the with the elements and the challenge of actually finding, being able to track prey animals, was seen as a much more valiant and, and noble thing to do. And, and part of what helped that to create that aura of you know, valent gallantry in hunting is there at this time, like the early 19th century or yeah, early 19th century, all these like you know, hunting writers or outdoor writers started popping up and even magazines. Talk, talk us about that. How did that influence how Americans thought of hunters? Yeah, that was a very interesting phenomenon is that in the early days of the Republic, initially it was horse racing was sort of the main sport for the elite. And it did continue to be so until about the time of the Civil War, say. But it was those same magazines that also began to report on what they called field sports, namely hunting and fishing. And they very quickly found that, among other things, hunting, unlike, I mean, a horse race is exciting too. And believe me, they, they there were some large stake horse races in those days. But hunting was something that they found had a kind of built-in narrative that hunting stories, they make for great journalism, really, because there's always an incredible story involved or can be, whether it's some overwhelming facet of nature one has to conquer, a hike, a mountain, or whatever, or actual contact with ferocious beasts, whether the beasts get away or not. In other words, as you can imagine, it's all, it makes for an intriguing yarn. And what they began to see is that this was a very rich vein of writing that they could mine. Uh, And there was a huge audience for it as well. And it also brought along a sort of hunting literature of that era, also brought along kind of an early, kind of like a Mark Twain-esque kind of humor out of, particularly out of the Southwest, which was then considered like Arkansas and maybe Kentucky, Mississippi, sort of like writers who wrote in a very humorous vein, again, a little sort of anticipating Mark Twain a little bit about local people going hunting their, their many gaffes and, you know, shooting their feet off or whatever it might be, some ridiculous thing that we could all, people could laugh at. And so that too kind of built in this idea of hunting as a kind of pastime that was both rich in humor, it it brought you in contact with nature and so on. And so that's really a big change that goes on in the 1830s and 1840s. And we should mention, too, that it has to do with kind of the romantic era in America, the idea that sort of the end of the idea that the wilderness was some place that we needed to needed to dread or fear, but rather that it held poetic and even curative aspects to it. 
that's one thing you notice in a lot of the early hunting journals, say up in the Adirondacks, is that I feel, you know, the hunter, not, you know, not only am I enjoying myself out here, but I feel 100% better. This air is really good for me. And I was, I felt terrible before and now I'm cured and whatever this type of thing is you're familiar with, like most of your listeners probably are. The idea that nature and sport, outdoor sports could be a wonderful balm for the, for the body and for the mind. And this, was very powerful in that early magazine writing about the sport. And not only did this sort of market around writing about hunting rise up, you saw this proliferation of art. So the Courier and Ives, you know, lit the grass. And I mean, I think everyone's, if you live in America, you've seen those. And like you said earlier in your know, introduction, like there's something about it that seems like timeless and nostalgic and romantic. Even if you've never hunted before, like you, you wouldn't mind having that in your house. Did, did that feeling exist then? Like, did people like look at those images and think, oh, I, that's so, I feel nostalgic for that thing. Or is that something that we experience now looking uh, back? Well, well, of course it's hard to say, cause it's hard to put ourselves in that, say the 1850s. But I think you're probably right that it was something that, you know, it wasn't just art, decorative art on the wall. It was, it was wood carvings. Um, you know, it was very common to have the sideboard in your dining room be ornately carved with a hunting scene or other s- furniture. And many of us have seen this. But yes, of course, it was some of it was sort of kitschy, even at that time. In other words, uh, obviously, hunting scenes of obviously sort of depicting a kind of the the sort of everything positive about the hunting, like waking up in the morning at the side of the lake with your your male companions and it looks like a beautiful day the guides are busy preparing the canoe and you're having your first cup of coffee you're look you're looking up you know up at the trees very like you're anticipating a wonderful day and yeah whatever, whatever. it sounds whatever. great it looks really great in other words the the art was almost like an advertisement for this 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 preoccupation basically so yeah there was a lot of that because some of it got kind of kitschy but it the, it persisted a very long time. As you mentioned, of course, it had ancient origins. It goes way back to some of the first artwork we know man ever did, which is to paint these things on cave walls. But it's proceeded it's all through the ages. I think what I was surprised by was how I knew about it, but I was amazed at how prolific it was. It was, you know, boys' pajama design, tablecloths, curtains, wallpaper, as I said, sideboards, pieces of furniture, and then, of course, a lot of Courier and Ives images. In up to the early 20th century, there's like a wonderful genre of what they called calendar art, which is everybody has seen these things, like old, beautiful color hunting images. What was very popular was what they called predicament art, which was a scene which we've all seen before of like two hunters waking up at their campfire with a grizzly bear kind of coming around the corner, and one of the hunters is reaching for his trusty rifle. And of course, it was a calendar for like a Remington calendar or something, or Winchester. But those type of themes, were they, people never seem to get tired of them. There's just like hundreds and hundreds of these predicament art calendar images and other type of images as well. But many of them do that. They kind of both sort of remind you of the necessity of having a trusty gun by your side, <laughs> but also the kind of incredible excitement and sort of man challenge of being out where, you know, ferocious animals are are right there by your side. So the sort of hunting as sport really got its start in New England, the Adirondacks, it trickled down to like what was then the Southwest, right? The frontier, Kentucky, Tennessee, but then the West opened up. And by the West, I think, you know, we're talking like the West, like Utah, Colorado, Texas. How did sport hunting change as the hunters started going West, um, the technology change? Did laws change? Tell, talk, walk us through that. Well, as one thing is I, I got very caught up in the idea of the U.S. Army being of some of the important people in terms of establishing hunting in the West. They were, of course, as you know, in those days, the West was the frontier, basically. And in addition to settlers or anyone who went out there, prospectors, whoever, obviously hunting for subsistence was a key thing, whether you're a mountain man or wherever you might be living. Uh, But the first people to really introduce sport hunting tended to be military officers, people like uh, George Armstrong Custer, who I talk about quite a bit. 
who prided himself on his hunting. I was amazed. Of course, we all think of Custer as a as an Indian fighter. But, you know, I got the impression in a way that for him, the Indian fighting was a bit of a moon like moonlighting. He really his, he was very much a hunter and even wrote about his hunting exploits at, at some length. So it's very interesting to me. He he took it very seriously and he was not alone. Many army officers stationed at places in the remote West. Remember, there wasn't, you know, it was the type, the Indian Wars were a kind of sporadic affair. And so there was a lot of downtime, as we would say, uh, at some stockade in wherever it might be, someplace in uh, Utah or Arizona, New Mexico territory, this kind of thing. And so this is what people did. Hunting, of course, there was a lot of wildlife around. Not to mention the fact that it was a way to augment army rations, so to go hunt for meat on the hoof, so to speak. So, yeah, hunting very much became established out west through, I, I think, through a lot through the army officers. At one point, even the army commissioned special types of hunting rifles to be distributed to the troops to basically encourage them. The idea was that, well, this will help improve their marksmanship and give them something to do because one of the big concerns of the army, the, the Western army in those days, was that the troops out of boredom would become, you know, basically, you know, fall into all kinds of sinful behavior because there was nothing else to do. They would gamble, God knows what else. So this hunting was seen as a kind of a, a more wholesome activity if we could give them these guns and ammunition to, for them to do it. And at the same time, it would help them, you know, prepare, you know, improve their marksmanship or what have you. So one other thing I'll mention, of course, with this is that the again, back to our wealthy European and English friends, a very popular thing to do was to come into the American West and hook up with a U.S. Army officer and go on a hunting expedition. In other words, a wealthy, say, a wealthy English earl or duke with his entourage coming into the West, hooking up with a Custer or various other leading officers. Often these were arranged by Washington because of, for sort of like diplomatic reasons. And then they would kind of go hunting together. So this had this effect of both generating the idea of hunting in the army, but also sort of universalizing American hunting and the American West as a place of very exciting hunting with animals that were to be seen nowhere else. Of course, one funny thing is that I'll mention I found hilarious was that the Brits, they would get off their boat in New York and think that there were buffalo right there. And they would be they would be surprised to hear that, oh, no, for the buffalo, you, you have to go out to Nebraska. In other words, and, you know, where's that? Well, that's like, you know, 1400 miles west of here, whatever it was. But they were disappointed. They thought Westchester, New Jersey, wherever might might have some buffalo. Yeah. You highlight one of these you know, sort of rich British barons that came and like he basically just unleashed a bloodbath in the West. And it, people were really happy when he left because he was like flaunting all American hunting norms at the time. I know. And of course, of course, it's it's odd that his, his last name was Gore, of all things. Sir, I think Sir George Gore. Yes, he was infamous. He came in the 1840s with, like, you know, really basically like his own army in terms of the entourage he had, the wagons. He brought every type of thing. You know, one thing about these early hunting expeditions is, one thing about sport hunting you have to realize in the early 19th century is it it attached itself very early to natural science. In other words, Hunters were always curious because they had to be. To be a good hunter, you have to kind of you have to pay attention to wildlife, to the forest, to to how, learn how to track and so on. And so, an interest in natural science was always featured in the hunting literature of the time. And these expeditions often had actual scientists attached, which was, of course, a wonderful thing for for science because you had this became a vehicle basically for a lot of Western exploration. But the, the Gore expedition was infamous because he just, he was not a fair chase hunter. He basically hunted. He came to America. He wanted to get as many trophy heads as he could. He just, you know, it was like, it literally was like an invading army. And he came, cut through a swath of like, Col I think Colorado, Montana, Wyoming, maybe Nebraska. He was here for about 18 months, I believe. And so finally, the local Indian tribes began complaining, like, who is this character? You let him out here. And he's, you know, he's he's taking our our uh, our pantry, basically. And he was eventually 
it, it, nobody nobody shed a tear when he finally packed up and left. And after that, of course, people would always hearken back, sort of cite him as an example of this type of excess and sort of guard against it if they could. So another thing you, you go into detail about hunting in the West, you know, you talk about bison hunting, right? The Brits yes. thought that the bison would just be in New York, but, you know, they're out West. And I think, yeah, some, we, if you grew up in America, you probably heard about this in American history. At one point, there were millions of bison roaming the plains and then just decimated during the 19th century. You've probably heard the story of people shooting them from trains. Uh, how did that change hunting when people saw that, oh my gosh, we can actually like hunt a species to extinction. Did that sound some alarms for hunters themselves? Oh, absolutely. It was, I mean, as you say, it was, it was one of these things where people couldn't believe what they were seeing. And of course it was the hunters who saw this happening first because they were the ones who were out there. What happened was of course that the, you know, a huge, with the railroads, after the Civil War, in particular, railroads extending into the West, there was it was much easier to ship buffalo hides back east. And it was also easier for hunters, both scrupulous and not so scrupulous, to get to the West. And, and many people began what they became what they called market hunters, basically. They weren't hunting for subsistence. They weren't hunting for sport. They were hunting for the hides of the bison. And, you know, the bison are... If you, they can be challenging to hunt, but they also can be very easy to hunt because they're a herd animal, basically. And one aspect, one feature of this was that the the Eastern rifle manufacturers had built ever more powerful guns for being able to shoot accurately at long distances. And so those two things together, the the, the demand for buffalo hides, the improved weaponry, and just obviously the opportunity to make money for those who wanted to go west being a buffalo hunter became a lucrative occupation uh, but you're right the speed at which these huge herds of buffalo were decimated was was incredible really terrible tragedy again because they could be killed easily enough that the numbers just became sort of staggering like what a team of market hunters could accomplish in one day or one week and so on and we've all maybe seen these images of a Western railhead with like literally a mountain of buffalo hides stacked up awaiting shipment back east. So, so yes, you're right. It happened very within really perhaps maybe 20 or 30 years from the 1860s. By the late 1880s, people like William Hornaday, who was a well-known naturalist and taxidermist, George Bird Grinnell, who was the editor of Forest and Stream magazine, these people began to see that what was happening was the species could actually be made driven extinct. And, you know, extinction was a very, just as now, it was a very heavy concept, but it was one that people were much less familiar with at that time. And it, it frankly was, was something that brought a lot of people up, you know, to, to a point where they realized that this, even those who had been ambitious hunters themselves began to realize that this could not go on, that something had to change in order to preserve the species. So at this point in American history, were there game laws on the book or were, what, did hunters govern themselves by sort of this, you know, uh, informal code? Um, a little of both. There were game laws, very, game laws came into effect fairly early. It's just that, as you can imagine, they were kind of, just because of the sprawling geography of America, they were either you know, they could differ from state to state, and also they were often difficult to enforce because of the law, the the great, the great sort of distances between places. And you know, one thing about hunting, and this is where fair chase ethos is so important, is that what hunters do mostly they do on their own, out in the woods. The whole idea is you don't go hunting with a large group of people; you hunt. The whole idea is to get out alone somewhere or maybe with just one other person. So it's on you to do right, basically. And that's why it's actually kind of incredible that we have the existing today the sort of system of game laws that are very strictly enforced that we have. But yes, you're right. To go back to that period, the game laws were kind of hobbled together piece by piece. It, like I said, it wasn't a consistent thing. A lot of it really fell into place to me, it seems, more late in the 19th century, 
around the time these concerns you're alluding to first came to people's notice, it wasn't only the buffalo, but it was also, of course, the passenger pigeon and various other, even white-tailed deer, people began to worry that their numbers were also being diminished as well. So there were a number of species where there was e either they did become extinct, like the passenger pigeon, or others that were so diminished that they alarmed what you would call, I guess, hunter conservationists. Right. And one of these hunter conservationists was President Theodore Roosevelt. Exactly. Tell us about his role in sort of the, the conservation movement in America. Well, Roosevelt's, of course, a fascinating guy in terms of hunting in this period because he is both a, a sort of very much part of this cohort of the early hunter conservationists. These were men who had they were largely from the east but they had lived in the west as as of course roosevelt did he had a ranch in north dakota they loved hunting but they also again were the first ones to see that there was a danger in over hunting in excessive hunting and they had often been the kind of true sportsmanship type hunters to begin with so they founded uh, an, a, a group called the boone and crockett club named for two of america's most legendary hunters and the idea was, originally, it was all about, more about the hunting. But within a few years, they saw that they actually had to change their track a little bit and actually get more into conservation. And so, yeah, they were involved with trying to diminish, trying to put down poaching, for instance, in Yellowstone Park. This was a huge problem in areas. This was a battle that this has been written about extensively. But this idea, this battle had to be fought, basically, between sports hunting that was guided by game laws and just poaching, which, of course, a lot of local people didn't like the term poaching. They just felt like, well, we've lived here for years. Why can't we hunt as how we please? Who are you to come in here and tell us what to do? So this was a set up this kind of a, a, a very fierce struggle that took a couple of generations, really, to kind of work itself out until the kind of game management system basically won out. And so that's where someone like Roosevelt is really pivotal because he was right there in the front lines of that battle fighting to make sure that game laws would be observed. At the same time, of course, Roosevelt had a whole nother side, which was, or maybe it's sort of the same, but, you know, Roosevelt was a big kind of like hunting is who we are as Americans. It's right. what makes us, it makes us strong. And, you know, it was very popular at that time in the late 19th century to point to the British and say, look at them, they're, they rule the world. And why is that? Because they're a nation of hunters and other societies that don't have a big hunting culture, they don't seem to get it. And so if we want to be like the Brit, we have to emulate them. And, and so uh, Roosevelt was very much, as you know, that's, he believed that this was important, that young boys should learn how to shoot and track and that, that hunting was a, a type of activity, among other physical challenges, that would help American men become more vigorous and, you know, better soldiers and, uh, <clears throat> you know, conquerors of other lands, this type of thing. Yeah. So you know, hunters played a big role in kickstarting the conservation, conservation movement in America. What's their role in it today? Are they still actively involved? I think they've actually always been involved. You know what, in the... It's interesting in the during the 1930s laws were put on uh, federal laws were were put in place there I will refer to them as they're, the they call them the Pittman Robertson laws and basically what they are is that it's a 11% uh, tax on hunting equipment guns ammo anything to do with hunting and so hunters all along have paid in all this money goes to local conservation efforts across the country and it's been a kind of undisputed success in that it creates this huge endowment for conservation works and helps kind of imbue the hunting community with this, this responsibility. And to this day, a lot of hunting groups say out West, they take conservation very seriously. They see it as sort of the other side of the sport that they love to their credit. And you'll find that a lot of conservation boards and organizations are actually very much under the influence of hunters who sit on in in positions of decision making and i mean by and large they've done a very good job over the over time because they've had this interest at heart and they still will you know hunters will 
volunteer a Saturday morning to go out and dig a tunnel underneath a road so that deer don't have to cross the road, this type of thing. So, I mean, it's that type of dedication that is admirable. The only thing about that, though, of course, is that in more recent, say, the last 20 or 30 years, their control of the conservation movement has come under fire from people who are, say, like, who look at a little differently and are more concerned about animal rights, the rate at which certain predator animals are targeted for hunting. So there are differences of opinion about it. And there is some effort to push back. Sometimes the people who challenge the hunters on conservation issues will do so through referendums in Western states where those are allowed. Say, for instance, about whether mountain lions should be hunted, that type of thing. So there is some pushback against the hunters, what seems to be their kind of large influence in the conservation movement. On the other hand, you have to kind of tip your hat to them because they have been at it a very long time and have, in terms of habitat protection, wildlife protection, keeping species alive and, and viable, they have done a lot of good work. So, I mean, what's the state of hunting today? I mean, it used to be this, you know, I mean, what, what's the state of, what was the state of hunting in say the 19th century? Did like pretty much every man hunt or was it pretty much, was it like a small percentage and what's that like today? Well, I don't, it's hard. I don't think it's ever been like a huge percentage, but it was a very substantial percentage of people were involved in hunting and fishing. As we know, part of the problem is just the urbanization of America today. It's not as easy to get to areas where one can hunt as it used to be for obvious reasons. There's just everything is more built up. You don't find as many young people, maybe because of this urbanization, Young people are not taken up with hunting like they used to be. There's a saying in the hunting hunting world that if you if you don't start hunting by the time you're 16, for instance, if you're not introduced to it by an older relative, you're probably not going to ever do it. And so, of course, that's of concern to hunters because they'd like to kind of they obviously they'd like to keep their sport vibrant. And there's a big effort in among hunters and hunting organizations and companies to nurture young young people. But of course, they have demographics kind of working against them. Young people nowadays, you know, they're on their smartphones, they're 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 hooked to the internet. Again, it's it's not as if you can just grab dad's shotgun and go up the hill and and do some shooting necessarily. It's much harder than it was say 100 years ago. So for all these reasons, hunting has it's diminished as as an activity that said those who are engaged in hunting are very ardent about it and if you go to like a hunting conference out west you'll be just amazed at the enthusiasm and the technical proficiency of the hunters how they talk about their sport and the great the great love they have for it is you is you can really see it and there's, there's new people coming into it all the time who you wouldn't expect. Women are the fastest growing demographic in hunting. There's also what some people call DIY hunters, people who never hunted in their lives, but decide to take it up as adults. They get a hunting license. They buy a shotgun. They, you know, it's like they see it as a challenge. Some of them are interested for inter food politics, uh, reasons of, of, you know, what, what am I going to eat? Am I going to, if I like to eat meat, do I want to be part of the industrial meat system? Or would I rather feel like I, I know where my, you know, I'm, I'm going to go out and, and try to harvest my own meat. So there's that aspect as well. So hunting, the face of hunting is changing a bit, uh, even while it diminishes, it is diminishing, it still has a certain, it, it has life to it. And I think it, it will, will always be around. Well, hey, Philip Dre, this is, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks a lot. I've loved it. Take care now. My guest today was Philip Dre. He's the author of the book, The Fair Chase, The Epic Story of Hunting in America. It's available on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can check out our show notes at aom.is slash hunting, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.